up. Today. All right. Um, thanks for uh, organizer for organizing this interesting workshop, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. So I'll be talking about uh, some recent work. Well, not so recent anymore. Uh, this very nice work uh, with uh, Scott Collier and Vladimir uh, Mazak. And it's going to be about uh, full track bounds on brains and boundaries in 2D CFDs. Okay. Uh, let me start with some uh, motivations. So first of all, let me just re-emphasize uh, the main player today of my talk will be uh, couple boundaries. to the CFDs. Okay? Although some of the things I will say uh, here today will have generalization in higher dimensions, mm -hmm. so the focus today will be in two dimensions. And this kind of objects show up in various contexts in physical uh, setups. One familiar example, if you know about uh, spin chains in kind of matter theory, uh, this couple of boundaries, or generally couple of interfaces in two-dimensional uh, couple of field theories, describe impurities quantum impurities in one dimensional spin chains. The kind of spin chains that also shows up in many geometry <coughs> talks that we have heard earlier this week. And also we know in string theory, couple of boundaries of 2D CFT, now the 2D CFT lives on Washi. Those couple of boundaries describe, uh, give you the Washi description of b -words. The boundary space of these Washi CFTs uh, give you a perturbative description of these DFTs. And lastly, uh, but, uh, there's a huge number of examples of couple boundaries in large C to these CFTs that are engineered in ABS CFT setup, in which case the holographic dual of these couple boundaries in a 2D CFT with a large center charge, a subset of them are described by the so called end of world brains. in EDS3. Okay. So this can be thought of as generalization of solutions to Einstein equation in the presence of some boundary that extends from asymptotic infinity into the deep EDS3. The study of couple of boundaries into the CFD uh, is a subject of very long history. Okay. So just to review some of the things we learned from the past Okay. Things you can find in textbooks. There are many examples of explicit uh, couple of boundaries, uh, which I'll also refer to as boundary couple field theories for short. There are various ex examples of PCFDs in rational couple of field theories. Okay. In cases where the boundary condition preserved in addition to uh, the Rosoro symmetry, which is the uh, enhancement of the conformal symmetry in the 1D, 2D setup. Uh, if the boundary preserves some additional car algebra that's uh, given in terms of the rational, that's given in the rational conformal field theory, an example of such boundaries have been explicitly solved. And secondly, as you probably all have learned uh, from Brzezinski's textbook, there are familiar examples of P brands in string theory that has very explicit couple of boundary uh, descriptions on the wall sheet, such as the supersymmetric, the supersymmetric, or in other words, BPS brains, in string theory of glass brains. So those have very simple uh, explicit expressions. Okay. And lastly, uh, regarding this point, uh, there are explicit some classical solutions. that uh, some of the questions that motivate to study these uh, objects are the following. 
first of all, when we look at the past literature that lists the known boundary, couple of boundaries in rational CFPs, we realize that only a very sub only a very small subset of couple of boundaries are known. Okay? In particular, those are the special cases where the boundary preserves not just zero sort symmetry, but in addition, some car algebra and log CFP. So in this context, we want to ask, even for rational C CFTs, where we know everything about, about the bulk operator spectrum, can we make more progress in understanding the, the spectrum of possible boundary conditions that just preserve the resource symmetry? Okay. And in the context of the supersymmetric and PPS brains in string theory, uh, there are hints of, so these, are, these brains have the merit that they're stable, they're protected by the fact that they're BPS and uh, they are stable against uh, uh, packing condensation, open stream packing condensation, but there are also evidence of non supersymmetric or more precisely non BPS ranks in string theory when the geometry has a non trivial internal uh, factor where the, the, the brain is not supersymmetric but yet still stable. Okay? So here we want to ask if there's some kind of generic, if there's uh, like more uh, general examples of such non BPS ranks. And whether we can find some conditions, uh, whether such objects can be stable or not from the bootstrap analysis. Okay. And lastly, regarding the semi-classical solutions, a typical question you would ask in this kind of ADS3 CFT2 context, where you have some semi-classical description in the bulk, a typical question you want to ask is if that semi-classical solution actually survived. Uh, at the fully quantum level, for example, at a finite C, okay. finite at large C. So here, the natural question to ask is: Are these semi-classical solutions previously found in literature for n wall brains fully consistent with the axioms that we want for the two-dimensional CFT, which I'll explain shortly? This is the Consistency of it is pure ADS3 plus and the war brain at the quantum level. Okay. And the goal of today's talk so that's the motivation. So let me now lay out uh, the precise goal we want to achieve. The goal, as to be clear from the title, is to explore the landscape of optimal boundaries or BCFTs by a booster, okay? which is a notion that everyone here is familiar with. Okay? So, as we as we all know, the pulse is a very nice rich machine um, that uh, relies on very basic consistency uh, conditions for the underlying object here, the PCFT, and can produce very universal bounds. Okay? But to, before we talk about any kind of bounds, because we're trying to delineate some kind of landscape, we need to provide a set of coordinates. So this coordinate is typically in term, given in terms of gaps in the spectrum, OP coefficients, certain OP coefficients, and things like that. Here, the, uh, the nice set of coordinates are given by the following. First of all, uh, first of all, let me write C, which is the familiar uh, two-dimensional center charge that gives you a path of the bulk of degrees freedom. Okay. And then for the boundary BCF, for the BCFT bootstrap, the important quantity is the delta gap. Let me emphasize here is the gap in the operator spectrum, the scalar operator spectrum. Okay. In particular, there's a scalar gap for the reason that, the, uh, the, 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 it should be clear why only the scalar gap is relevant for analysis. The reason should be clear shortly. And then because we're studying uh, BCFT, uh, boundary data will come, come into play. And there's a close analog of this C function in the presence of a boundary. That's the familiar, that's the, that's the well-known G function that due to Affleck and Ludwig. 
this is sometimes referred to as the boundary entropy or boundary T function. That gives an analog of some kind of uh, uh, characterization of the boundary degree of freedom. Okay, that's in addition to the center charge that comes bulk degree of freedom. Okay, and analogous to the operator gap, the scalar gap in the bulk. Okay. Another coordinate we'll need is the boundary operator gap. Okay, so this is on the boundary, as we'll see. There's a single copy of the resorber that's preserved. And this H gap is the gap in the uh, scaling dimension, uh, in, the, in the list of scaling dimensions uh, for the boundary. Okay. So once we know uh, the coordinates, okay, we are ready to, well, I'm ready to present you uh, the results as you get bored later. And then I'll explain how we uh, got these results in mm -hmm. some, some level of detail, depending on the time. Mm -hmm. So let me emphasize the results will be, in this talk, will be for uh, boundaries of bosonic CFD. Okay. Just for the next words. Uh, the first result is the following. We'll find uh, universal. Okay, actually, before that, let me just uh, uh, make this more kind of uh, uh, kind of just make this more intuitive by giving you an explicit example of how such a set of coordinates look like in the familiar theory. Okay. So let me uh, uh, partition out this small space for that purpose. So example. Uh, let's consider boundaries. Uh, in seek to one compact boson at radius r bigger or equal to the self to radius, which I'll normalize as square root two. Okay, so I'm choosing a particular two obvious frame. There's no loss of generality, generality in this parameterization. In this case, there are, uh, the boundaries have been completely classified, and that is not uh, why we're doing this project. We're, of course, we're going to be probing things in the unknown uh, region. But just to give you a feeling of how this coordinate looks like, let me give you this explicit example. So in this case, uh, I hope I have enough space. Okay. So, uh, this, like this. Okay. so there are two familiar uh, uh, family of boundaries, of all boundaries in C21 compact boson. Uh, they are known as the Dirichlet boundary condition for the compact boson, parameterized by a circle variable theta. Okay. And there's a family of uh, T-dual boundary condition uh, that are usually called Norman boundary condition, again parameterized by a circle value phi. We can normalize them such that they take value between 0 and 2 pi. In this case, the, uh, the bulk yeah, okay does not depend on the choice of boundary condition uh, you take. Okay? And for my parameterization, the bulk scalar gap is always 1 over r squared. Okay? So the gap is maximal at the self-two point and can go all the way to 0 as you take the radius of the circle to be large, okay? as you would expect for, for some CFT with a sigma model description. Okay? There's a question? Now, the other quantities like h gap and g, the g function, will depend on the boundaries. Okay? In particular, the, the boundary operator gap for the Dirichlet boundary condition will go like r squared over 2, whereas for the Norman boundary condition, because they are related by t-duality, if you work it out, it's going to be computed by this inverse value. And the g function here goes like 1 over squared of r, and in this case, it goes like square root of r over 2. Uh, sorry, the 2 is in the square. Be careful about vectors. Okay. So this is a particular example where such a kind of a coordinates look like restricted to the space of boundary conditions for the seek to one scale. So question? Sorry. This yeah. is for the entire prime. 
Uh, so yes, yeah, so so I should have said that. Um, so when I speak of a scalar gap and uh, and the boundary operator gap, I'm always talking about respect to the Verasoro representation. And uh, this is for for u one times u one. These are the equal ones, or uh, so this this uh, this these are two families of couple boundaries for the C two one compact CFT. Mm -hmm. These are not only these are not the only couple boundary conditions for the C two one CFT. But they have been classified here. I was just listing the two familiar examples of that. There's another family. No, no I mean this is there a gap is for uh, the, 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 this guy carry charge. Sorry. Uh, the capital the gap. The, this the, this operator carry charge. Yes. Yes. It's a one-in momentum operator. Yes. Okay. yes. Are you not programming the same? Where is the bound? <coughs> what is the bound of entropy? Can we hear it? Oh, uh, the boundary entropy. I will, I will, I will, I will, have, will be more explicit. Can we, can, we give it, can we give the boundary entropy a more pedestrian? Yeah, yeah. You will see explicitly how the boundary, boundary entropy yeah. comes in, comes in at the level of open stream and function. Yeah, in ki in case of this complex scalar, right? Uh, right. So it's related to. So if you think about this, this, this as a D zero brain, this is a D one brain. Uh, in case of this complex scalar, would yes. it be possible to give more explicit uh, description of all of this table? For example, Dirichlet boundary condition. Can we describe it in terms of the complex scalar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So by Dirichlet, literally mean it's a boundary condition for the scalar. So you are just fixing this x field to a particular value that's related to theta. Okay. And here, for the normal boundary condition, you are imposing this equal to zero. Okay, so this is the direction normal to the boundary you are imposing the boundary condition. And then this parameter is coming from the choice of the Wilson line on the boundary. Which line? Wilson line. So if you think about a divine brain, this is the Wilson line. Okay? And in terms of the geometric picture, if you think about this as a sigma model with a target S1, this will correspond to the D0 brain. Okay, so it's a brain localizing target space. And this will correspond to a D1 brain, namely a brain that wraps the entire uh, target space. Gauge connection. Wilson line on the world volume of the D1 brain. I understand, there's no gauge theory. I know. So, so it's a Wilson line in the, in the uh, like in usual 2D context. You can build the com complex, you can build the flat connection using some scalar field. So you have a current. Current is conserved. So you can treat that as a, a flat connection and you can write the Wilson line in terms of that. Okay. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a it's a kind of a terminology. If you don't if you don't like that, uh, it's just coming from the uh, you know the residual x model you can integrate that on the boundary. Does it simply mean that you allow the x field to be not periodic, but have have a, like a shift when you go over the points? <coughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. I mean these are these are a dual picture. So if you write in terms of dual variables, it's just fixing the location, which is related to what you're saying the uh, the phase shift. In the viewer. Okay. Why are the values of G not interchange by T duality? Uh, T duality is R, in my uh, normalization, is R to 2 over R. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, so how about G? Uh, that, that works. 2 over R. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. All right, so that uh, we passed that consistency <coughs> check. Okay, so now I'm ready to present the uh, the main results. Okay, so I have limited time, so I'll focus on a subset of results. Uh, okay, so first of all, we'll derive some upper universal upper bounds on the G function with the physical criterion. The upper bounds will look like, we'll say the G function is bounded above by something that's a function of the bulk center charge. Okay? And the physical criterion is that uh, the brain is required to be stable. Okay? So in this talk, I'll use interchangeably because the relation between D brains and boundary <coughs> conditions, uh, we'll, I'll use interchangeably uh, brains and boundaries. Okay? Hopefully, that will not cause any confusion. But if it does, let me know. And uh, uh, technically, what this means is that we require the boundary gap to be bounded below by one. Okay? 
So because the, the boundary is a one-dimensional object, if you were to have some operator with scaling dimension that's more than one, it can be turned on and trigger uh, RT flow on the boundary, the kind of example that uh, Gabriel mentioned uh, yesterday. Okay. Second, we'll find unique. So here are some general bounds. But in particular theories, in particular theories with uh, uh, enhanced symmetries, like rational conformal field theories, we'll find, we we'll can do better, we'll, we'll find unique solutions to such stable brains in the sense that it'll explain. In the sequence of RCFTs, uh, with center charge bigger than one. The reason being that uh, for center charge smaller than one, uh, because those are all mirror sort of mirror models, and for all those cases, the entire uh, spectrum of Cardi branch or the BCFPs have been classified. Uh, for C bigger than one, is already open question, and in this uh, in this uh, uh, in this work, we address uh, what are the possible stable branch in this theory, and we find unique solutions. Uh, but, uh, here you mean that preserve only Grassor, right? That's right. Okay. Yes. Uh, everything in my talk, everything only only. Uh, we only require them to preserve a sorrow symmetry, but as we'll find, there will be interesting symmetry enhancements. Okay, but will you find situations where there isn't a symmetry enhancement also? Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll find that we only impose pure sorrow symmetry, but we'll find that uh, uh, if the brain is stable, uh, this is something I'll get to, if the brain is stable, it turns out it will have an enhanced symmetry. Okay? So it's almost suggesting that uh, for this boundary RG flows, um, symmetry is always getting enhanced. Okay, I'll, I'll, um, I'll restate that in a little bit. The third uh, result we find is that the semi-classical solution, the semi-classical and the warbreak solutions, which I mentioned, is incompatible. So this, this solution is a one-parameter family of solutions. Okay? So we have been constructed by solving that same equation. Uh, in, in this kind of geometry where there's a, and a war brain that uh, uh, where the geometry terminates, okay, that extends from the SMOD boundary into the deep ABS. And this is the one parameter family solution. We'll find there's region in this one parameter where the solution are incompatible with the bootstrap boundary. Okay. Uh, I put quotation mark on the pure gravity just because there are various versions of pure gravity in ABS3 in the literature. Uh, and I'll, I'm talking about a particular uh, kind of the most kind of a, a naive version of it, which I'll be uh, um, explicit. Uh, because here I'm just summarizing the results. I don't want to get into the detail just yet. Okay. And furthermore, uh, we'll find refined bounds. So this is kind of universal, but we can also, and here we have some unique solutions, but you can also be a little more general than this, okay? But uh, uh, get more refined bounds than the, this universal result over here by putting in more information uh, of the other coordinates on this landscape, okay? In particular, uh, we'll find uh, refined and lower bound that depend on both uh, and only the bulk center charge and bulk scalar gap and upper bound. <coughs> that now depends on um, also the boundary uh, operator gap. Okay. In particular, uh, among these refined bounds we find, <coughs> the, among these refined bounds we found, uh, we found analytic bounds okay, uh, that give mathematical proofs for the sketch band that the G function is bounded strictly below by one and saturated, but in special cases, uh, in the special RCFT, the EA level one RCFT, and the monster squared RCFT. Okay? So these are CFTs that center charge C to eight, the W is W model level one with E8 group manifold. And here, this is the familiar monster CFT. Okay, I'm taking the square such that there's no gravitational anomaly, and that's, that is potentially obstruction for homophonic boundary conditions. And once we take the square, there's no gravitational anomaly, so I can talk about boundary conditions. 
And lastly, uh, this is related to this line, okay, is that we have this observation, uh, not just in the example, but actually in all the examples I can think about, think of as I was preparing for this talk, is that there's this generic seem to be a generic phenomenon of symmetry enhancement. Uh, into the PCFT, meaning that you have a CFT, you have a fixed CFT to the CFT, and some global symmetry. The moment you introduce some defect, in this case the boundary, you typically will break the, uh, the global symmetry in the bulk to some subgroup. Okay? But what we find in other examples I know, combining with this, uh, this new result, is that there will always be symmetry enhancement as you, uh, as you uh, follow the RG down to the deep IR. Okay, this is, seems to be very mysterious, and I don't know if this is something that's generic into the RCFT, uh, into the CFT in general. But for this statement, you are assuming stability, right? That the gap yeah, in the bound so, is Yeah, so, so, so by symmetry enhancement, I mean you follow down all possible yeah. RGs, okay? So if you are, if you are, if you are, it means that if you are, uh, your bounding condition admits, huh. uh, uh, you know, a relevant operator, you turn it down, you follow down the RG. Hmm. In the P by R, you always find symmetry. This is for C, only C bigger than one. This is only for C bigger than one. For C smaller than one, you might have discrete symmetry. Okay. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. This week also. So this is only for okay. So this is only for continuous global symmetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, there could be a statement for uh, discrete global symmetry as, uh, as well, but uh, that we haven't analyzed. Uh, the the evidence one. I have is for the continuous global symmetry. In C less than one, you don't extract it, right? It could be that the issue like condition that break. That's right, and there's no way there's no way to kind of restore it unless you have a, a you know a direct sum of boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, I should have emphasized that here when I talk about boundary conditions in our brains, uh, I'll be focusing on the irreducible boundary condition. You can always take a, a, a you know a positive integer linear combination of boundary condition. That will be a valid boundary condition that will satisfy the axiomatic constraint I'll, I'll talk about but I'll focus on the elementary building blocks. Uh, you can think about them as uh, irreducible boundary conditions. Okay? So those are the main results. Uh, let me now explain how we get them. about CFP we like, <laughs> that Heter throw away in his talk, to the CFT, and center charge uh, CFT for R equal to 1. The C equal to 1 case will be a test ground for the bounds we get, but I'll probably not have time to present it here. The interesting bounds uh, concerns the CFT of center charge bigger than 1. And usually I'll be known as operator spectrum as delta and j, the numerate operators in the, uh, uh, well, corresponding to the states in, in the Hubert space. On in this case, the couple of boundaries can be characterized as follows. So one kind of intuitive way to characterize a couple of boundary is a boundary condition okay, that you impose for your CFT on the upper, upper uh, space. Point. And the fact that we want it to be conformal means that you want to preserve the maximal conformal symmetry subgroup that you can on this uh, geometry. Okay. So certainly you will break the translation symmetry, but there's a maximal conformal subgroup that's nothing but the diagonal subgroup, and that can be achieved by this fluid condition on the stress sensor in the bulk, okay. uh, which is a condition imposed at uh, this. Uh, uh, location of the boundary, which in my uh, coordinates is at the imaginary z equal to zero. So I'm rotating the complex usual parameters in a complex z point in this way. Okay. And I'll denote a boundary condition by b. 
Now, a couple of boundary conditions for 2 DCFT is closely related to what's known as boundary states. By a simple conformal transformation, And on this side, uh, you can map this uh, uh, the boundary of alpha half plane uh, to the region outside the circle. So this is the this is where the boundary maps into. Okay, and this defines a boundary state, which I call E, which is naturally a state uh, in the Hilbert space size one. And this condition, this condition will translate to some particular condition that the state must satisfy as a particular vector in this hyperspace. Okay. And this condition, the solution to those conditions uh, are given by the so-called Ishibashi states. <laughs> so these are the Ishibashi states. Uh, they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with scalar primary, scalar Verasaro primaries in your box CFT. Okay? And the only leftover information to fully specify this boundary state uh, will, be come from, will come from this coefficient, which I'll denote by uh, the alpha phi. Okay? Alpha specified uh, the particular bounding condition I'm looking at, and phi tells me the coefficient in this decomposition of the boundary state into the Ishibashi state that solves this word identity that ensures a diagonal conformal uh, sub, uh, sub algebra is preserved. Okay. Question? Okay. And the reason that the only scalar showed up here. So the, the, the fact that only scalar shows up here is why we only care about the scalar gap. And the reason that that is the case for this, uh, for this uh, uh, boundary state is because the boundary state preserves the translation symmetry around the origin. Okay? And that's why only the scalar Ishibashi state, I mean only the, uh, this boundary state only have overlap with the scalars okay? and the corresponding uh, descendants that all package into this uh, uh, Ishibashi state. Is it possible to modify this construction so that it's not scalar? Uh, is it possible? Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, you mean if you consider boundary condition that does not, in this picture, does not uh, preserve the translation asymmetry, for example. Uh, but I don't know a physical reason for doing that. But yes. Thank you. It's a restatement of the fact that folk. Operators can only get a one-point function. That's right. So bulk operator can only have a one. So this is a statement about general dimension. A bulk operator can only have a non-trivial one-point function in the presence of a conformal boundary only if the bulk operator itself is scalar. This is true in general dimensions. Okay. For for general BCFPs, only a scalar operator can have a non-trivial one-point function. So a particular stress tensor itself will have a zero. Oh, so these coefficients v alpha phi are related to the one-point function. Ah, uh, that's right. That's right. Yes. Okay, so this is, the, this is exactly what I was going to say, that these coefficients are related uh, to the one-point function of the bulk operator uh, in the presence of alpha. Okay? In the presence of boundary level by alpha. Okay, so now that we have solved the work identity by constraining uh, this boundary state into this form, all we are left to do is to determine or constrain these coefficients. And this coefficient will be subject, <coughs> subjected to constraints from the consistency of open closed CFT, okay? which is generalization of the usual uh, axiomatic constraints you have on the CFT with only local operator insertions. Okay? There's a generalization. And they're uh, written here. Okay, let's move, let me move to this, this side. Okay. So there are two types of uh, conditions. So this condition has been completely spelled out in, in very nice papers from Hardy and then from Hardy and Avalon. Okay. Uh, here I'm writing down uh, two particular conditions that will be uh, uh, 
uh, actually only this condition will be directly relevant, but this is something I'll mention in the conclusion. The first condition is the so-called Cartier condition. It's reminiscent of the, uh, the multi invariance of the torus prime function. But now, you consider instead a cylinder. Okay? So you consider the 2D CFT on the cylinder geometry with two ends. And on the two ends, you impose the condition d alpha and d beta. Okay? And this is a cylinder. And you can think about the cylinder in two different ways. In the first, on the left-hand side, you can think about the cylinder as computing the evolution of this boundary state by the closed-string Hamiltonian. The closed-string Hamiltonian, in terms of the familiar reverse order generators, are given by L0 plus L0 bar minus C over 12. Okay? So again, I'm assuming there's no gravitational anomaly, so I can talk about boundary, so C and C bar are the same. And uh, we can think of the cylinder sideways as well to compute the different function. We're free to choose how to quantize. And on the right-hand side, here I'm viewing the cylinder sideways. And we can think about it as the open string thermal opening function. Okay? So it's one loop opening function. And the propagation is given by the open string Hamiltonian. And the my normalization is just given by L0 minus C over 24. Okay? So you can think about it as gluing the two ends of a strip. Okay? And on two sides of the strip, you have the condition D up and D theta. And the current condition is a statement that these two must give the same result by consistency. And the second uh, non-trivial constraint on these boundaries, uh, uh, I think it was originally due to Lavalier and Cartier Lavalier, but for the purpose of generali uh, generali generalizing to higher dimension as well, I will refer to it as uh, both boundary bootstrap equations for the, for the reason that it should be clear. The point is that you, instead here, you look at observable that involves two bulk operators, phi and phi j, in the presence of a boundary. There are two OPE channels you can consider to decompose this two-point function. One OPE channel is you take the OPE of the bulk operator first, that corresponds to the bulk OPE channel, in which case you, uh, you spit out a, a sum over one point functions mm -hmm. of operators that appear in OPE of phi and phi j, which I label as phi chi, and you sum over one point function of that in the presence of the boundary. Now, on the right hand side, we have another channel, in which case it's, uh, it's called the boundary channel, and in this case, you first uh, take the OPE of these operators with the boundary, okay? And you sum over boundary operator that's being exchanged, okay, which I level by set psi L. So this, this equation is important in the sense that it relates the spectrum of the boundary operators with bulk OP data. Okay. And uh, this, this condition, together with uh, a few more conditions, which is very similar to this, uh, this, uh, this kind of condition, but with additional uh, boundary operator inserted, uh, they consist the entire set of uh, axiomatic constraints uh, uh, open closed CFT. Okay? And there's a general expectation that by solving this uh, set of equations, uh, there's a unique solution to, this, uh, uh, to these conditions. Okay? And so far, there's no counterexample. And this is very different compared to higher dimensions uh, because here, what this means is that essentially specifying, fully specifying the bulk operator and OP data completely determine what kind of boundaries are admissible. Okay? This is very different in higher dimension where you have much more possibilities, even if you focus on couple boundary conditions. Okay. If you're this coefficient, if, if the scalars are real, the B alpha phi are also real? Uh, we'll come to that. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, there's a normalization choice uh, here. Okay. But uh, yes, there, there, there will be a normalization choice where this is, uh, this is actually the first coefficient will be positive. So we're seeing this is not a complete set of crossing equations. Yeah, so the other ones I didn't write is when you have additional uh, boundary operator inserted here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this complete set of equations were written in uh, Lavalier's paper. Okay. So back, what, back to what we're doing here. Uh, so we'll be less amb ambitious instead of solving the full set of uh, consistent conditions required by, uh, sorry, instead of solving all the axiomatic constraints coming from requiring the consistency of the open closed CFT, 
Uh, we'll focus on the simplest uh, constraint, uh, which is coming from the Cardi condition. Okay. Which are the constraint will be uh, placed on this coefficient appear in the decomposition of the boundary state into each brush states. From the card okay. And while well, some of the methods we use have generalization, here I will be even more uh, specialized. Uh, consider the case uh, with identical uh, boundary conditions on the two ends of the cylinder. very simple uh, constraint, okay. it's kind of similar to the moderate constraint. Uh, perhaps this is not uh, so surprising for the bootstrap community, uh, but it's kind of still kind of surprising to us is that we will find very strong results. Okay? We will find this non-trivial bounds, the universal bounds I talked about, as well as this unique uh, solutions to stable brains in a set of RCFPs with center figure down one. But the universal bounds, do you also need to impose the fact that the bulk spectrum uh, is consistent with modular invariance if there's one? No, no. We don't, so we don't need to put in the additional information. We don't need to put in the, in addition, the, the bulk modular uh, uh, bootstrap equation. Okay. So we're only studying this equation. That's why we find it uh, surprising. Yeah, it is. That's right. So to set it differently, you, you only, while you specify about box CFT, the most universal bound we find, you only, the only thing you need to put in about box CFT is just the center term, nothing else. And just by looking at this equation, and while you're, you know, you can use your dual analysis, getting numerically, uh, you find these bounds. Okay? All right, so, so we'll find very strong results, as well uh, explained. Uh, and the magic, of course, as you, uh, you, you all know, is coming from uh, unitarity. Okay? This, this is a crucial point that I wrote in the beginning. Uh, or in other words, the positivity. Okay? Reflecting positivity. Okay, so let me just write down the equation that we want to solve. We want to tackle and produce a balance. Okay? Uh, this is just going to be an explicit writing of this equation okay, in formula. To write that, let me introduce the, the following parameterization uh, of the cylinder okay, by the usual kind of uh, uh, square, okay, just to avoid any confusion. Uh, 2 pi is my uh, normalization for the, uh, for the circle okay, on which you reimpose your boundary conditions, okay, two ends of the cylinder. And t in this funny normalization uh, parameterize the modulus, remaining real modulus of the, of the cylinder. Okay. And then the usual Q and Q little parameters, which are the S dual parameters, uh, which, which are the usual parameterization of the modulus of the torus, now generalized to the case of cylinder, are related to T as follows. Okay. And the modular transformation is given by T equal to inverse uh, T. Okay. And in this notation, let me just write this Cardi condition, so it's the it's given by the propagation amplitude between the boundary state uh, labeled by B alpha, okay, uh, by this uh, length pi t. Okay? That's why I put pi t here, okay. And this is uh, going to be equal to the dual channel expression, think of the string channel, uh, as a trace because the thermal boundary function can be written as a trace over the Hilbert space. Uh, on the strip with two ends specified by the boundary condition B alpha. Okay, that's, that's what I meant by this H alpha alpha. That's the Hilbert space on the strip. Two ends with the same boundary condition B alpha. And weighted by the open string propagation. Uh, weighted by the open string uh, Hamiltonian. Okay, that dictates propagation along this thermal circle. Okay. And, uh, okay. and because 
because in two dimensions, conformal symmetry is enhanced to various order symmetry, but both sides will have a nice decomposition into uh, various order characters. So this is what I was calling closed channel, this is open channel. And this means that I have, a, uh, I have this following decomposition. dimension delta i. Delta is the sum of left and right scaling weights. And you have a square, you have a R2 just because the, the normalization of the of this uh, time direction I have over here. Instead of 2 pi t, you have pi t. That's, that's why you have a over 2. And these b's are these coefficients. Uh, so here, let me just <coughs> to be consistent with my notation, I know by b alpha i. Alpha labels the boundary state. I labels all the box scalar parameters. Okay, so those are the unknown coefficient one to constraint. And the coefficient square appears over here, the modular square. Okay. And on the right hand side, uh, this ends, uh, so each each j, so alpha, alpha labels the um, in this case the open string uh, hyperspace, and j enumerates the possible Virasoro primaries that appear in the superspace. And this coefficient is a positive integer that counts the generacy of such primaries, and this is the, the, the usual Virasoro character. <coughs> Okay. And note that the parameters, the modulus parameter Q and Q fiddle here, are related by the usual S dual, as you would expect, because you are changing the perspective of what you call time or space. Okay? Alright, so and this is, let me just uh, uh, put a start here, because this is the main equation that I'll be looking at. And we'll be trying to use this equation to use all the bounds that I promised in the beginning. Okay. So, uh, before I get into the more technical detail, let me just make some comments about this equation. So first of all, uh, this is something that probably I do not need to emphasize, but let me just say that in case uh, there are some students that are new to the bootstrap uh, uh, community, uh, this is a very complicated equation. Okay? The both sides of the equation in principle involve infinite sum. Okay? For, uh, and for C1, a C bigger than one, that's always the case. There are infinite number of representations, versus representations, and consequently, both sides of the equation will involve infinite sum. You can just make sure the function pi that appears on both sides is the same, right? Yeah, it's the same function, just with different arguments. These are all, they are just versus characters, uh, with the holomorphic wave h, and here, delta over 2. But the, not the q here are real. Okay. All right. And this equation is similar is a similar, similar level of difficulty uh, to the usual uh, modular bootstrap equation. Okay? Second, even though this is complicated, as I was saying, you know, both sides involve even the number of unknowns, you can just turn on the right hand side as well, uh, it has miraculously have exact solutions. In RCFTs, something I mentioned in the beginning, the reason it happens is because if the boundary state preserves are large enough, her algebra, uh, which in, in general a sub algebra of the car algebra of the full RCFT, if the boundary state preserves a large enough sub algebra, this infinite sum of both sides okay, can be decomposed with respect to characters of this enhanced symmetry, this car algebra. And in those cases, this sum can be made into finite expressions. But now summed over primaries of this enhanced car algebra as opposed to the sum over Virasoro primaries. Okay? And in those cases, uh, this equation can be really thought of as a polynomial equation, and you can solve it uh, uh, exactly. Okay? And in these cases, for example, uh, in diagonal 
our CFTs, such as the Verasoro Ver Ver models, the boundary space will be in one to one correspondent. The boundary space that preserve the, the, in this case, the full car algebra, will be in one to one, one, -to -one correspondence with the car primaries in the ball. <laughs> And these are among the examples that were first came up by Cardi. Uh, there are solutions to these uh, equations. So for that reason, this, these boundaries are also known as Cardi brains. Okay. And a small comment I want to make uh, is, uh, is the following. Okay. So there's a way if you have, if you already know some boundary conditions in your CFT, okay. there's a way to generate generate other boundary conditions. Using topological defects. Okay, so these are special kinds of conformal interfaces in 2D CFT, uh, which is uh, 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 observable, including this uh, this topological defects does not change under small deformations of these defects. And if you if you have some boundary conditions in your CFT and you know some topological defects, which are labeled by Li. The given one combination by P, you can do the fusion between the topological defect and the boundary, and this will produce a new boundary state. Okay? It's not obvious from what I've said, but the consistent condition that's satisfied by this module defect will ensure that the boundary state you get over here will automatically satisfy all the consistent conditions if P is a solution to that consistent condition. Okay? I don't have time to explain why that's the case. Uh, but let me just mention, there's this way of generating new boundary conditions from no boundary conditions uh, by fusing with the topological defect, which can be inferred from uh, symmetries and so on. Okay? And the important relation... So uh, these topological defects are a symmetry generator. So topological defects are general, generalizations of usual symmetry generators. In a special case, for the experts, in a special case, when the topological defects has the quantum dimension equal to 1, they correspond to ordinary symmetry generators. In the cases where the topological defect has quantum dimension bigger than one, um, they generate they, they generate non-invertible symmetries. Is it obvious that B prime is simple? No. Yes. So there's a subtlety that B prime uh, in general can be reducible. Uh, but in any case, there's a, this general relation between the P function of the of the new boundary B prime to the boundary condition B, okay, by this simple formula, where this is the quantum dimension of, uh, of this topological defect, which can be found out by just the, the plane function uh, you know, on, the, on, the, on the plane where you have this topological defect inserted on the circle. All right. Oh, how much time do I have? Uh, 10 more minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on the on the subset of all right. So let me just mention a, a few more things about this G function since it was asked in the beginning. Uh, the G function is uh, physically interesting because it controls the high temperature uh, high temperature limit of the open strain. Cutting function in the following way. Okay. So if you consider the open strain cutting function in the limit of t goes to infinity, okay, this in my characterization corresponds to the high temperature limit. In this case, the cutting function looks like g squared uh, times some exponential divergence, uh, uh, exponential divergence, okay, plus subleading terms that are suppressed exponentially. Okay. And this G function crucially uh, controls the coefficient of the exponential divergence. And for that reason, it contributes to the boundary entropy. Okay. A subleading piece to the boundary entropy that shows up as log G. And it also gave rise to a regularized uh, dimension of the Hubert space on the strip. Okay. So because you're sending T goes to infinity, that means that uh, this Q total is going to one, so 
So you're summing over all the possible states uh, weighted by one, and of course it is going to diverge, and this coefficient gives you the regularized counting of the number of states. Okay? The divergence is controlled by the bulk center charge. And uh, another thing I just want to mention is that G function uh, is a PCFT RG uh, monotone. Uh, meaning that uh, it monotonically decreased under boundary RG, and even better, uh, the RG uh, is uh, the boundary uh, for this uh, boundary uh, for the PCFT case. Sorry, actually, as a general fact, uh, as proven by some work from uh, by uh, nice work from Gabriel and collaborators, uh, that uh, the for for line defects in general, in general CFTs, dimension two or higher. Um, the, the, this uh, defect RG um, is a gradient flow, okay? uh, and the G, fu G function and actually is a properly generalization along the RG you known as the boundary entropy uh, is what realizes this gradient. And uh, the kind of bounds that, uh, that we look for here can be all rephrased uh, in terms of bounds on G. Okay? And as should have said that previously there are some weak uh, bounds, numerical bounds, uh, upper bounds, uh, oh sorry, uh, weak lower bounds uh, from the work of Friedan uh, et al. And now I'll see uh, some of okay. Sorry, I didn't get it. Where does D appear in your crossing clearing? Uh, sorry, where, where, where? where does D appear in your crossing? <coughs> in, in, in what? In this crossing equation, I suppose it should appear somewhere? Yeah, uh, sorry, so, so I, have, I should have emphasized. Okay, sorry, I missed that. Uh, the, the G, <laughs> yeah, sorry, that was a terrible mistake. The, B, the G appears here, it's the coefficient that's multiplying the, uh, the Ishibashi state corresponding to identity. Okay. So, Thanks for that question. It's very important. I don't know how I forgot about that. Uh, this is the G function. So this is the this I use zero to denote the identity <coughs> operator, and the coefficient multiplying the identity Ishibashi state in the decomposition of the boundary state uh, is the G function. When you say the function, you mean the function along the RG flow? Uh, so here I don't know why historically it's called the G function. There is the confusing for various reasons. Here I call it G function just because. Uh, it assigns a number for any uh, given a whole boundary of the CFT. It's a function of alpha. In other words, alpha parameterize denote the CFTs, uh, to denote the, the couple boundaries for a given CFT, and G alpha specify the G function for that, uh, for that boundary. Do we know if alpha is a continuous parameter? Uh, alpha can be continuous, yes. For example, for the duration boundary condition I was talking about, alpha <laughs> could be this parameter theta, but G may not depend on alpha. Depends on the particular case. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So the strategy to solve this equation star. Uh, is the functional method. The, 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 the strategy we really adopted in this paper to solve this equation is a functional method, uh, which starts by rewriting this equation in the following way. So importantly, th thanks to the question asked earlier, g would appear over here, so I'll kind of extract it from this sum and write as an isolated term, multiplying the character, multiplying, uh, multiplying the character associated with the identity of the resolvable. Back in the sort of block. Okay. I'll also isolate uh, the contribution from uh, the identity operator from the right hand side. And here, the, the assumption that I made earlier about this uh, boundary condition being irreducible comes into play. Uh, that's equivalent to requiring that there's a single dimension zero operator in the decomposition on the right hand side. Okay. So I have just one here as opposed to some integer, positive integer. And then I have the, the sum over all other uh, contribution from all other uh, bulk scalar primaries with dimension bigger than zero. And then uh, 
the contribution from the boundary. Okay, so this is the usual kind of uh, bootstrap equation that you probably have encountered in many works. Okay, and uh, the way we solve this equation, uh, there are many parameters in this equation. So of course you want to look for some uh, some bound as a function of a number of parameters that appear here. And the parameters will uh, fix uh, in order to derive bounds is the box center charge. Okay? And we'll put some assumptions on the, uh, the box scalar gap. Okay? So where we determine where the sum starts. Okay? And uh, we can also put some assumption on the, uh, the boundary operator gap, where the boundary sum starts. Okay? And then the, the usual thing to do is to look for <coughs> Positive uh, functionals. Okay. Which have nice properties when you act when you act this functional omega on this characters. Okay. Uh, because I'm running out of time, I will not explain that in detail. Uh, but this gives lower and upper bounds. This is a kind of a systematic way to derive uh, a reverse lower and upper bounds on this coefficient g of plus four. Okay. All right. So can I ask something? Yes. If you consider the boundary condition, which is a sum and has more than one identity, yes. do you expect the results to just follow from this, or there to be some independent <coughs> new results? Uh, so, so the 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 the, the g function for for. Uh, for uh, a, uh, like a direct sum of boundary conditions, it's going to be the sum of the individual ones, so there's not going to be. A... I have another question. Are these coefficients, the coefficients n, alpha, alpha, j, are they integers? Yeah, they are positive integers. Are uh, you opposing that condition? Yeah, so very, very good question. So, so this is what I was going to mention in the end. So in this, in this, uh, in this work, we do not, and it's a very important question already in the context of motor bootstrap to understand. How to impose integrality of uh, you know of the any function with decomposing inverse or characters that would give much stronger bounds, but we do not have a, we do not know how to proceed at the moment. Okay, very nice question. All right, so instead of uh, kind of boring you boring you with uh, like uh, all the technical details, let me just mention one way. So this is the general functional approach. Let me just mention one way to approach this equation uh, in this uh, special case. Okay. Uh, using the analytic function. Okay, and this is uh, partly based on uh, Dalimel's uh, previous uh, result. A uh, one D bootstrap. Okay. So the the kind of problem, the nice thing about analytic functional is that it gives you very uh, they give you uh, kind of immediately very strong bounds. Sorry, give you immediately uh, kind of explicit bounds and also allow you to extract this spectrum quickly. Okay, if it is saturated. But the, uh, the kind of uh, difficulty part, difficult part about this is first to come up come up with analytic functionals. And the only example we know so far are all related in some form to the functional that Dalimel found in the context of one D bootstrap. Okay, and it was later applied. To the context of spinless spinless bootstrap in two dimensions, spinless modular bootstrap, and here we generalize to the case of uh, this uh, cylinder or annulus bootstrap uh, associated to this, this this object. And to do that, we need the map between the full point function, which we will study in this paper, to the uh, cylinder penny function. Okay, and indeed such a map exists, and we find that this is, this is actually a general result. Well, it's actually, if you think about it, if you think you uh, spend, <laughs> spend enough time, you can probably figure this out yourself. Uh, there's this following simple relation uh, between a four point function and uh, the cylinder pattern function labeled by two bounding condition, uh, which I can know by alpha and beta. Okay? And what this, uh, what this uh, uh, right hand side is R. Uh, so this four point function. It's a full point function of operators that live at the end of interfaces. 
phi alpha here, phi alpha, phi beta here, phi beta. Okay. Alpha and beta are different. And these two interfaces, if you zoom in, can be thought of as the folded boundaries labeled by alpha. So here, I also unfold a little bit to, to show you what I mean. And these phi's are universal operator at the end of the factorized interface. We thought of know from this kind of obvious location. So this, this can be thought of as, if you have this interface, uh, this is a unique operator that, uh, you know, that has the lowest scaling dimension at the end of the interface and has dimension uh, equal to C over uh, 16. Okay? So you can ask me afterwards how I derive this, but it's a, actually a simple derivation. You can show that such a unique operator exists for the special kind of factorized interfaces. And uh, now that we have this explicit relation, and if we know the spinning dimensions of these general operators, we can use the functional uh, dynamo uh, develop over there and employ it to this equation, and we find the following result. And, and then I'll just end. The result is fine. We find this, uh, we find the functional that is constructed using this map from the functional that in this 1D bootstrap says uh, it's, it's saturated in two special cases of C. Okay? The functional is saturated in these two special cases, C equal to 8 and C equal to 24. And you know, for the C equal to 8 case, what it says is that if the boundary operator gap is bigger or equal to 1, this implies <laughs> the G function is strictly bounded above by 1. And in this case, if the boundary gap is bigger or equal to 2, it says that G is strictly bounded above by 1 at the end. Okay? And furthermore, it also says that if the bulk scalar gap uh, is bounded below by 2, uh, it implies that the G is bounded below, uh, bounded below by 1. And similarly here, if the bulk scalar gap is bounded below by 4, and uh, the, the G function is again bounded below by 1. Okay. So, so far I've said nothing about the, what the box CFD is, only input information about the box center charge, and run this machine, okay. and this is the boundary we find. Okay. Very explicit. Okay. And furthermore, whenever this uh, inequalities are saturated, the, uh, whenever this inequality is saturated, for for the uh, when they saturated the the cylinder branch function, okay, cylinder branch function, in the C to A case, okay, it's completely fixed, okay. So I said maybe I, I'll let me just say I mean uh, you probably know that the when the when the when the, uh, the function method when when the when the band I mean when the when the gap from the functional is saturated uh, by the particular theory, then the uh, you can read out the zero uh, you can read out the spectrum from the zero of the functional. In this case, you can, you can show that the, the open stream boundary function is completely fixed, okay? uh, and it's fixed to be the, the famous J invariant <coughs> in the C to A case to the power of one third. And then for the C to 24 case, it's determined um, to be the J invariant minus 744. Okay? And these are precisely uh, the, um, the open stream boundary function associated with well-known boundary conditions in the EA level one CFD, and here in the monster square CFD. Okay. And once again, we have not used uh, the modern invariant symbol. In, in, this, in this case, is, uh, yes. The set of alphas is continuous, discrete. Uh, Doesn't matter. Yeah, anything. Well, I, I'm, I'm asking. Oh, sorry. In this case? Yeah, in this two cases. Uh, in this case, they are continuous. I mean, they are. Uh, they can be continuous, but I don't know. I don't know if I will call it manifold. It's probably some stack. But yeah, they are continuous. I think it's, and you are able to find the value. It, it's not a bound. It's an exact value, right? Uh, you mean here? Yes. 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 
That's right. So, but, but, but it may not be so surprising if you think about it, is because uh, the, this particular um, uh, open stream bounding function, when you impose identical boundary conditions, is kind of uh, uh, agnostic about uh, various uh, parameters associated with the boundary state, right? So, for example, as I, as I told you before, for the, just for the D brains uh, in, the, in the S1 single model, the, the gap does not depend on this theta and phi that parameterize the D brains. But if you consider the open stream binding function, if you instead consider an open stream binding function with different uh, boundary conditions on the two ends, alpha beta, that will be sensitive to this continuous parameter, which I, which I did not, uh, but we, I did not discuss that. Before. Maybe to postpone my question, or then if you want, maybe answer it later. I just want to understand why you have, uh, why your method gives you a z result rather than uh, some bounds in the board. Some bounds are what? Some inequalities, rather than inequalities. Sorry, uh, why my bounds give uh, inequalities? Usually bootstrap gives you inequalities of different kinds. But yeah, so I got inequalities. These are inequalities I'm talking about. Yeah, so here when saturated, the functional fixes the funny function completely. Okay. Uh, okay, so I can go on, but let me just not let me not spend more time on this. Let me just mention that there are a huge family of RCFTs where the analytic functional method does not apply. The okay, analytic functional is only saturated in the special center targets. But we have the numerical functional method, okay, which, which we can systematically explore numerical functional to improve our balance using the STPP. And we find for a family of RCFTs, uh, as we do level one, actually the, uh, the RCFT that live in the Align exceptional series that show up in various contexts seem to be bootstrap, G2 level 1, spin 8, level 1, F4, E6, E7, and so on. Okay. Well, the <coughs> last one is E8. Okay. All this at the at the uh, WW level 1. In all this theory, we find that uh, the um, the uh, um, the stable uh, boundary condition, meaning the boundary condition that has a boundary gap big or equal to one, uh, completely has a pattern function that's completely nailed down. And that coincides with the vacuum character for this maximal parallel algebra. And that's the evidence I was talking about earlier before, that even though we do not, when we study these uh, theories, we do not put in, we do not put in the constraint where the boundary condition have to, you know, preserve this kind of symmetries, that's obvious from the W's of the description, but we find that if we just impose the condition that the boundary should be stable, meaning there's no more relevant operator you can turn on to trigger RG, we automatically find this symmetry is preserved. Okay? That's this big statement of uh, symmetry enhancement for this BCFT RG flow that I was talking about before. Okay, uh, I did not cover everything, but I think uh, this Sorry, I, did, I didn't understand. Here, here you, you only put in the supercharge. Uh, the supercharge? You, you, the only input in this star is you is, are the uh, central charge. Uh, good question. So. So here, uh, so in some of the examples, like the, this example, mm -hmm. and the, for the E8, we only put in a certain charge. Mm -hmm. okay? But in the most generic example, like the G2 and SU3, we also put in the information of bulk scalar gap. Mm -hmm. okay? But we do not assume that the, the boundary, um, you know, the, the, the boundary condition preserve anything beyond the reserve. Okay? But we find that, uh, you know, if the boundary is stable, it will automatically preserve this mm -hmm. Because we can pin down the funding function uh, completely. In this case, numerically, in this case, analytically. Okay, uh, I think uh, this is perhaps a good time to stop, and uh, I'll be here for questions. Thank you. H gap, then you get a smaller G. Yeah. That is the, the other side. Right, right. So the intuition is the following. So so you need the gap large you need the box scalar gap. Uh, so so okay, let me repeat the statement. Uh, the question. The question is about uh, it seems that I need the bulk gap uh, large enough in order to have a non-trivial lower gap. Okay? The reason is the following. Uh, the reason the reason is that if you are sick if you if you focus on CFT which I have a sigma subscription. There are these B0 brains, 
So if sigma CFD has, has a sigma model description with target M, then, then there's this T0 ranks, okay? This general fact that the T0 rank is a, a, it's a T function will be proportional to uh, some power of the volume of the uh, of the signal model uh, target space uh, M, okay, to some power. <coughs> okay, but uh, and so so you, you see that you can make the G function as large as you want uh, if you uh, sorry. So so this is the this is the opposite end. Let me consider the you know the the D brain that's wrapping the entire thing. Uh, 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 let me call it normal. Okay. okay. So this is the opposite end I was uh, thinking about. But. Okay, some positive power. Uh, so you can make this as large as you want by taking a large volume of them. But you know from general argument, the cost of doing that is that you are lowering the bulk gap to arbitrary small value. Because uh, if you are looking at a very large target space, uh, essentially you approximately have these plane waves, which give you a continuum of bulk value. Okay? And this is why in order to uh, have this bounds, you need a large enough gap. Okay. <coughs> I think you said at some point that the value, like G being one, is special for stability reasons. But I, uh, I missed... did I say that? Oh, okay. Then, then I missed even more. But yeah, well, why why is G equals one special? Uh, a G to one is special from the analytic functional. So it turns out that from the analytic functional, uh, we find that the bounds will always appear at G to uh, at one. So you either have G smaller than one or bigger than one. But the uh, uh, for the numerical functional methods, I mean the bound, you know, it's not one. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just mean in, in these two cases. Yeah, in these two cases, yes. It, it seems like you you were imposing, you were trying to find what gap needs to be imposed so that g would be less than one or g greater than one. Uh, well, why don't we say that when c is 24, h gap larger than one again makes g something else? Oh, oh, oh. <coughs> here I just mean that. Uh, uh, so this is the this is this is the this is the case where the you know the uh, the analytic functional is, is saturated. So we can study of course we can study the, the bounds with the assumption that h gap is at one. Okay, but then the the bounds from the analytic functional will just be a bound, but it's not uh, you know it's not saturated. Sorry, so we can now put down the honey function. Whenever you input a gap for h of yes. the, in the boundary structure, yes. the functional should give you some bound for h. That's right, it's just weak, yeah. <coughs> I mean, g can be bigger than 1, for example. Yeah. Yeah, so if the gap is uh, smaller than 2, there are explicit constructions of g that's bigger than 1. Yeah, it, it just looks like from the presentation that you were, you were trying to find uh, ways to make g uh, sorry. So, so perhaps I was not clear here. I mean, the so this is the this is the um, these gaps are chosen to saturate the uh, the you know. Well, I mean, the, I mean when, when either side is satisfied, everything is uh, uh, you know all the inequalities become the inequalities become inequalities. So. I mean, there are different ways to interpret this bound as bound on each gap or versus on G, but that's just a matter of. Are you saying that in a, in a 2D space, yeah. uh, parameterized by G and H gap, yeah. this 2, 1 is sort of a corner? Is that what makes a special? Uh, right, right. That must be the case. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps we can talk after. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Kelly.